Okay. Hello. Um, so uh, first, uh, just in terms of announcements, uh, the um, the prompts for the second uh, writing assignment are up now. I put them up last night, so you can see those. Um, as for a grading of the first one, I didn't even know what. <laughs> I'm trying, but I'm making very, very slow progress. I'm sorry about that. Um, um, and I guess there's one other thing which I hesitate to mention somewhat, but like the YouTube video for my second lecture on Du Bois got a dislike. <laughs> and I mean, it's probably, it also got a comment from some random guy somewhere, like, why are you still wearing that useless mask or something like that? Maybe, maybe he was the same one who did that. But, but you know, if it was a lecture about like, you know, Barclay's idealism or something, I would be like, okay, someone just liked it. But, you know, considering how charged the topic is, I just want to like, you know, it's possible someone was hurt or offended or whatever by something I said. And if so, like, if you can, please let me know. <laughs> Is what it is because I like I can't tell who who gave it this one. You can't you can't tell that. All right. Anyway, that goes back to Dewey. Um, so uh, all right. So there's no there. I'm gonna kind of pick up like what I. What I dropped in the middle last time, <laughs> um, um, but it's going to take me to the new material almost immediately. So, um, right, so we're in this new industrial period, and um, and the new industrial period requires corporate action. So, I mean, um, he's using this, of course, in a broad sense in which a corporation is not necessarily a business entity, let alone like a for-profit business <laughs> entity. But, um, but nevertheless, those, those things that we usually think of when we say corporation are included, right? I mean, that's, um, we need, the kind of action that corporations can perform. Um, and I mean, I think this is essentially the same, uh, or anyway, closely related to Adams saying that we need to move from an individual ethics to a social ethics. Um, right, that, that, that somehow like they, actors now are going to have to be um, super personal or super, indi super individual. Um, um, I mean, it's also, I guess, like more distant related to Du Bois saying that the history of the world is the history of races, not the history of individuals. But I mean, it's more distantly related for a number of reasons. But for one thing, because he doesn't say that's true now and it could be used to be true, right? So like, this is Dewey is more similar to Adams because he's saying that, yeah, in the, like, in the pre-industrial age, we didn't need this corporate action, but now we do. So, um, and it leads him to, um, advocate for and or predict as inevitable some form of socialism. So there again, like Du Bois and like Adams, um, So we emphasize, therefore, that socialism is, as he understands it, is not about, um, it's not primarily about redistribution of wealth. And this is so, now this is from the new material, I said I would go through it right away. 
uh, in chapter six on page 50. Um, the myth is still current that socialism desires to use political means in order to divide wealth equally among all individuals. And that it is consequently opposed to the development of trusts, mergers, and consolidated business in, in general. Right, so that this, uh, this thought would be that socialism is for the purpose of like not allowing some individuals to take resources at the expense of others, but making sure that everyone gets a fair share. And he's saying that, you know, what he's calling socialism isn't about that. Um, in fact, he says, this is further down the same page, this notion of socialism is of the sort that would naturally be entertained by those who cannot get away from the inherent conception of the individual as an isolated and independent unit. I don't know what the word inherent means there. The inherent conception? Inherent in what? <laughs> I just realized that. I don't know. Anyway, um, I understand the sentence without inherent. This notion of socialism is the sort that would naturally be entertained by those who cannot get away from the conception of the individual as an isolated and independent unit. Um, right? So, like, this is the socialism that individualists would come up with. They would say, like, um, you know, we're all individuals. Uh, why do we need socialism so that each individual can get their fair share? But, um, but you know, and then they might say, so in order to attain that end, we're going to need, right? Like as he puts it, again, the, uh, the myth is that socialism desires to use political means in order to divide wealth equally among all individuals. Right, so the idea would be that the end of it is the equal distribution of wealth. And the means we're gonna use is central political control of the economy, because otherwise, how are you gonna make sure that wealth is, is equally distributed? But, um, but from Dewey's point of view, it's the central control and planning is the point of it to begin with. Um, and whether it results in uh, equal distribution of wealth is is um, not so important. <laughs> um, so uh, you know we were talking about one forty four when I when I teach one forty four I point out that Hobbes is basically a socialist, right? Like Hobbes thinks that property is created by the sovereign, that is by the by the government. And the sovereign can reallocate it however uh, they see fit, <laughs> um, and that that's necessary, right? But as far as whether some people will get more wealth than others, he doesn't care about that. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know that I could go so far as to say Dewey doesn't care about that, but he's saying it's not the main point. And um, so you know, so what he imagines is going to happen. Or at least what he what he imagines as an appropriately American way to do this. American because it's going to be voluntary. Um, a coordinating and directive council in which captains of industry and finance would meet with representatives of labor and public officials to plan the regulation of industrial activity. That's how he imagines this happening. Um, so everyone would get together and just decide, I guess, he's thinking, would decide like what capital should be invested in, what things should be produced, how much of one thing versus how much of another thing should be produced. Um, um, and the people who are meeting to do this are the captains of industry, the captains of finance, the representatives of labor and public officials. Um, so, I mean, uh, 
I don't know how relevant it is for me to wonder about this, how relevant to this course is. I mean, it's it, it seems like, so I think what he thinks is that we're already on a irreversible path to industry being dominated by um, huge like monopolies slash conglomerates um, slash trusts, right? And that um, those those things will have captains, <laughs> and um, whatever industrial activity is going to happen will only happen if those captains let it happen, right? That is, he thinks that's happening anyway, right? That's that's the point. That's like that, that's. I mean, I think that's why chapter six is called uh, um, capitalistic or public socialism. Right, he's saying that like um, what's what's clearly going to happen um, if no alternate arrangements are made is that there's going to be a body of captains of industry, and they're going to each decide for themselves, um, you know, what kind of activities are going to go on in the economy, and they're going to do it based on their own private interests. So he says, instead of that, let's have those captains get together with the representatives of labor and public officials and plan it for everyone's best interests. So, I mean, um, and if there was going to be some kind of new activity in the economy, then first of all, it would be also it would also be industrial, just like what we had already. It would be new industrial activity. And it would be impossible without like capital um, uh, that um, is controlled by the captains of industry and finance. So like he's not imagining something like the advent of Google, <laughs> right? I mean, that's very far from, I mean, not surprisingly, in 1930, that's very far from what he can imagine happening. Yeah, you know, like, I mean, I don't to say that, I'm not sure that his plan can't accommodate that somehow, but I'm, I'm just, you know, like pointing out what things looked like in 1930 and um, how, like, how at least apparently a lot of the things that seemed clear then turned, turned out to be wrong. <laughs> All right, but in any case, so that's the plan. So we need corporate action. We're going to have so we're going to have this kind of socialism to deal with it, and it's going to be voluntary. I mean, I'm not sure what he means by by voluntary. Uh, um, I mean. Does he mean that if some captain of industry decides not to participate, well, we'll just do it without them? Or does he mean everyone will have to agree, will be by consensus? Or uh, I'm not sure exactly what he means. But anyway, he says this is going to be voluntary. Um, and um, and like this is what our situation demands, right? Otherwise, um, um, you know, these various captains of industry driven by their own private interests will produce too much of some things and too little of other things and uh, like the economy won't be able to function. Um, okay, so like that's what has to happen. Um, and he also says, however, that this is hard for us to take hard for us, us meaning like Americans, right? It's hard for Americans to take this. It seems un-American, <laughs> like an un-American activity, right? And um, so why is that? And like, um, I think a first pass at why this seems un-American is that it seems to threaten the like traditional American ideal of freedom for all in order to uh, have equality or something like that, equality of opportunity, um, right? That that this traditional American, like the kind of thing that Declare is talking about when she says anarchism is actually a traditional American value, right? That 
um, everyone should be free to pursue happiness in their own power they see fit without outside interference. Um, um, remember that like it was that that also why De Clare said that this that socialism, like even anarchist socialism, wouldn't be acceptable in America. And she like to some extent endorsed that herself, right? She said, like anarchist socialism, okay, I can see the positive side of this, but it seems to involve too much central control to be uh, consistent with true anarchism, right? That was her worry. So, like, so, so Dewey is looking at the same thing, but of course he's raised, he's reaching the opposite conclusion, namely that um, uh, if individualism is interpreted that way, then it's uh, it's a bad thing because what we need is socialism, <laughs> right? So, um, um, So it's so from his point of view, this is a problem, right? I, I think, and he expresses the problem this way. You know, this is in chapter four and page 35. Um, individualism has been identified with ideas of initiative and invention that are bound up with the private and exclusive, with private and exclusive economic gain. By the way, so when he talks about the kind of individualism that he thinks we need, he's going to bring back these same words, initiative and invention. He's not opposed to initiative and invention. He does think that those are somehow tied up with individualism, but it's ideas of initiative and invention that are bound up with private and exclusive economic gain. As long as this conception possesses our minds, the ideal of harmonizing our thought and desire with the realities of present social conditions will be interpreted to mean accommodation and surrender. Right, so like, so this like socialist corporate future is gonna look to us like, okay, maybe we need to accept it, but accepting it means like giving up on individualism. And um, um, and therefore it's uh, you know. As I said, hard for Americans to accept. We don't want to accept it. Um, um, so, I mean, I mentioned what Declare says about this. This is also similar, although again, more distantly related to what Du Bois says when, when and remember, this is in that essay, that early essay, Conservation of Races. He says um, that, um, you know, it's a patent fact that world history is a his history of races, not of individuals. But then he says, quote, we who have been reared and trained under the individualistic philosophy of the Declaration of Independence and the laissez-faire philosophy of Adam Smith are loath to see and loath to acknowledge this patent fact of human history, right? It's hard, we, we don't want to accept it because, so like it's, this is in conflict with a, a specific principle of Americanness, namely a kind of individualistic principle. A, a principle that's identified with the Declaration of Independence by Du Bois and I think by uh, Dewey, to remember at the, at the beginning of chapter six, he described this lawyer he knew uh, who um, proposed a constitutional amendment prohibiting all joint stock enterprises, permitting only individual liability, right? And the lawyer said like, this would, uh, you know, restore American ideas about individual initiative, et cetera. So, right, so there would be no way to, I mean, you could form a partnership, 
but you could, there would be no way to limit individual liability. Um, so it would prevent what we call corporations or anything like it. Um, and Dewey says, he was, I think, the only unadulterated Jeffersonian Democrat I have ever met. <laughs> right, so it's, it's, it's Jefferson's thought of expressed in the Declaration of Independence and elsewhere that, that, um, that makes it hard for us to accept this. Now, um, Dewey thinks I mean, it's complicated. Like, on the one hand, he does think there's a concept of individual or individualism that really is threatened by this, but it's an old one that we should be getting rid of. Um, um, but uh, individualism per se, and you know, and like that's what I, I was trying to talk about a lot last time. Like, what does individualism mean for Dewey? Like, what do all forms of individualism have in common? What, um, right? Because remember, I started by saying, of course, we're worried about individuals and whether individuals can be integrated or whatever. But that doesn't per se make us individualists. Being an individualist means there's something about individuals that has to be protected. And I what I was saying is that for Dewey, like the what would be a threat to individualism in general would be this standardization, right? Where everyone becomes the same and there's no room for originality and uniqueness or initiative and invention. Those aren't exactly the same as originality and uniqueness. But in any case, standardization, I guess, would rule out both, right? Like everyone would be the same. There would be no room for originality or invention. And there would be no point to initiative, right? Like in initiative meaning that um, you start something that no one else would have thought of. Right, but there isn't anything like that because everyone thinks the same thing. That's, you know, so that's the worry. And but what Dewey says, um, I mean, I think I already pretty much talked about this last time, but, uh, um, but I don't think I got to this point. He says that, um, Elimination of individual originality and uniqueness is actually like a deliberate product of private ownership. Um, now, I mean, remember, I, I explained part of why that was last time, right? He's saying that since under this system of private ownership, um, um, the the people involved in doing the corporate action um, don't have any role in planning or controlling it. So um, they're not, they're like not really part exactly of the society of the things that are being done in their society. Um, and so they have no true unity. Right? They don't really all go together in one society at all. And um, so something has to be substituted, and what ha what gets substituted is the standardization. But I think what I didn't mention last time is how he thinks this works. Um, and so this is back in chapter three on page twenty one. Um, the need for united action and the supposed need of integrated opinion and sentiment, right? So there's like two things here. There is a need for united action, right? I think that's another name for corporate action, basically. There's a need for united action. There's a supposed need for uniformity of, sorry, of for integrated opinion and sentiment, integrated. 
That's not the way he usually uses integrated. I think it. I feel like here it must mean something like uniform, although integrated doesn't mean. <laughs> I don't know. But in any case, um, the need for united action and the supposed need of integrated opinion and sentiment are met by organized propaganda and advertising. Right? So the point is that, like, in this money culture, um, the, these private individuals, the captains of industry or whatever, um, have the... Um, um, they're the ones who have the motive for producing united action because the united action is going to be for their benefits. <laughs> they're like they're they're like reaping all the benefit of it. So they're the ones who have the motive to make sure it happens. And they also have the means to make sure it happens because they have the um, techniques of advertising and propaganda and the money to make them happen. Now, I mean, this is like, this is a very common theme in the mid 20th century. I think that, I mean, I guess a lot of people still believe this. I don't know, I don't think I do, but that, I mean, that there is or soon will be a kind of like engineering, like social engineering like a technology that will allow us to manipulate humans the same way we manipulate like the physical world or something like that, right? So that it's just a, it's just a matter of like, you know, developing this technique, <laughs> spending enough money on it. And um, as Dewey says, although he does qualify this, um, like this the next thing he says, um, there are individuals who resist, but for a time at least, sentiment can be manufactured by mass methods for almost any person or any class, right? The qualification is for a time at least, right? Like he's not sure how, how stable the results of this technique are, but um, so, um, I mean, it was a, it, it was a time, a, a lot of optimism, or you could call it from this point of view, pessimism in the social sciences that, you know, soon we're going to understand human society the same way we understand physics and we'll be able to do engineering with that and it will work just as reliably and just as well. So, you know, I mean, I, I think, I mean, it's actually similar to the issues about, about centrally planned and controlled economies that, like, um, planning and control turned out to be harder than people realized. <laughs> I, I think that's true, you know. So, um, I mean, actually, this is something, it's, I think this is pretty closely related. What I've heard is that when, you know, they first started programming a uh, general purpose digital computer, like ENIAC or whatever, that they were very surprised to discover bugs, right? They thought, you know, they were using it to solve differential equations so they could build atom bombs or whatever, right? So they were like, they thought, you tell the computer what to do and it does it and you get the answer. But suddenly they discovered that uh, it's not doing what I thought we told it to do. <laughs> and then they realized, actually, it's pretty hard to tell it what <laughs> It's very easy to tell to do the wrong thing, you know. So, um, um, right. So, like, as far as that, you know, like technique of advertising or, or you know, public relations or whatever, um, you can still pay people who who say that they can do it, right? Um, you know, like. Is, it seems like their their main success is selling it to the people who are paying them. <laughs> so, and 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 even there, it's like 
do those people really believe that they're going to get this or are they just like they know they can't be sued by the shareholders because they paid a recognized marketing rate. Right? So like in any case, that, that's all my own uh, speculation, which you can, uh, you may want to completely disregard. But getting back to Dewey, right? So he's saying, you know, that um, um, the technique for manufacturing at least maybe not very stable, but at least like for manufacturing for a while, the kind of uniformity you need to artificially bring about either side action is now available. And so um, so this standardization, it's true, is gonna get worse and worse as long as um, the motives are in the wrong place for how to use it. But he thinks, and I think this is gonna, I think this is a big difference between him and George Grant, who are reading next. He thinks that if it's used with the right motives, it will be great. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, right, and you know, because again, the technique or tech, I mean, I, I he never, he never defines these terms, technique and technology. They're obviously almost the same word, right? The technology has this logos at the end, but I, you know, like, I don't think, again, as opposed to Grant and some of the people Grant is reading, I don't think Dewey is thinking a lot about what that logos is doing, like what it literally means. You know, but so I, mean, I think he's using technology in the narrow sense for like technique involving machines, and he's using technique in a broader sense, but they're both supposed to be products of impersonal science moving forward, right? So in other words, the techniques for, for um, manipulating individuals, which uh, supposedly exist, are um, not called into existence by the bad motives, right? They're not, they don't, they're not an expression of those bad motives. In, the, in and of themselves, they're good. We could use them to like make our society better, but uh, they just it happens that we're stuck with this old money culture that's using them wrong. Okay, so so like as I said, that's kind of a first pass at why this corporate action and socialism Dewey thinks is going to be hard for Americans to take. Um, and that's his answer to it, right? Like, don't worry about this. Um, I know it looks, I know it looks bad now, <laughs> but it looks bad now because it hasn't gone far enough. As he said, I think in a quote I read last time, right? The problem with standardization is that it doesn't go deep enough. It isn't enough. <laughs> right, it just superficially makes people line up with each other. But um, if we were using these techniques properly, it would allow everyone to be integrated and act together. Um, and at the same time, everyone would be acting on their own initiative and we would have originality and uniqueness. So, um, um, so that's supposed to be the answer. So in other words, far from conflicting with those ideals, this is going to be the way to actually achieve them. Um, but the reason I say that that's a first pass is because when we get to the last chapter, it turns out the problem maybe goes a little bit deeper than it seems at first, right? But it's not, so like, on the one hand, there's a specific principle or principles listed in the Declaration of Independence. You know, all men are created equal, blah, blah, blah. And what we've just been talking about is whether this plan for corporate action is like in conflict with that, and Dewey says it's not. But, 
beyond that, there's the there's the very notion, and this is the thing that remember Martin who said that the revolution had proved that before the revolution you might not have thought, namely that it's possible for a constitution, like for the way people are governed, the governing of men, as the place would say, right, to be based on a principle. That's what she called the a priori method. Okay. So, although she said it would be better called the inductive method, because um, it's not really a priori. But um, so, um, so that's like American, perhaps in a deeper sense than the particular principles in the Declaration of Independence. The question is can we have a government based on principles? Um, based on universal principles. This, of course, is the question I've been asking over and over since the beginning of the course, and it's just another um, round in it. And I think Dewey's thought is on this deeper level is that the answer is no, it's not possible, and it really never has been possible. It really never has been possible. Um, so, like, this is chapter eight on page 80. Um, wholesale creeds and all-inclusive ideals are impotent in the face of actual situations where doing always means the doing of something in particular, right? So, so Dewey is saying that um, really no society, pre-industrial, post-industrial, right? like it's not possible to act based on wholesale creeds and all-inclusive ideals. Um, why do we have the feeling that it is? <laughs> and the answer, he said, is that old societies were static. Before industrialization, societies were static, and now they're no longer static. Okay, so this is also a lot, most of the things we're going to read now are in chapter eight, although not all. This is on page 72. In static societies, those which the Industrial Revolution has doomed, acquiescence had a meaning and so had the projection of fixed ideals. So uh, never mind the acquiescence thing, but I'm interested in the fixed ideals. And he says goals and ideals could be imagined that were as fixed in their way of existing as conditions that were as fixed in their way of existing as conditions in theirs. Right? So like in a static society, conditions were relatively fixed for static means. And therefore, ideals could be imagined as also fixed. So it's always the same ideal. And it seems like that would work because everything else was always the same. So the example he goes on to give is how like in the medieval legal system, they could define the, the just or correct price of something, right? And you know, you could say like, if you, if you were charged more than the just price, um, you know, the sale is invalid. And you know, that was because at least in his telling, that was because um, like people didn't realize that prices could fluctuate <laughs> because they didn't fluctuate. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if this is good medieval history, to tell you the truth, but in any case, be that as it may. Um, so, uh, um, so his his you know like leaving aside that as example that example his claim is that everything was like this and so people thought they were appealing to fixed ideals, um, uh, and that that would work, but like um, now our society is no longer static. So I guess like the opposite of static, I guess is dynamic. Now, 
I don't recall that Dewey uses this word at all. Um, it's also not clear why this should be the opposite of static. I think it's maybe a weird historical, right? Because dunamis doesn't mean motion, it means like force or power or potential or something like that. So, like, why also this is Latin and this is Greek? <laughs> so, like, why static and dynamic should be the opposite of each other? I, you know. But, um, and as I said, Dewey doesn't use this word, but why am I writing it up here anyway? Because we'll see that George Grant used this word a lot. <laughs> and um, dynamic, like to us, dynamic sounds like something good. Right? Like, of course, we'd rather have a dynamic society than a static society. Um, and like, I mean, to the point where you know, people like without even thinking about static, you can, you can like show your approval of something by calling it dynamic, <laughs> right? But, um, and I think Dewey ultimately agrees that the new dynamic society is gonna be better than the old static society was, not just different, but better. Even though like in the transition, it's causing huge problems. Um, but on the other hand, we'll see next week that Grant thinks that dynamic society is, and I don't know if I should say it's, he thinks it's bad exactly. Maybe he does, it's bad per se. But anyway, he thinks it is out of something terrifying. And, you know, he'll keep talking about the impossibility of Canada's survival because it's next to, quote, the most dynamic society on earth. Right, and when he says that, I mean, he is expressing a kind of like impressiveness of American society, but he's not giving it a compliment. <laughs> um, and moreover, moreover, the reason Grant is going to be afraid of that, and by the way, Grant definitely read Dewey, like he, he mentions Dewey. <laughs> uh, the reason Grant is going to be afraid of that. Um, is uh, is more or less the exact same reason Dewey says people feel it. The only question is going to be, is that a good reason? Right? So this is why Dewey said people fear this. Um, this is on this is still in chapter eight on page seventy eight. The mind that is hampered by fear lest something old and precious be destroyed is the mind that experiences fear of science. And again, like the, the march of science is what's generated this dynamic society. Um, that industrialization is primarily, according to Dewey, is the result of science. So um, what he's saying is, um, why do people fear science? when it seems like such a good thing? Well, they fear it because it causes, causes the dynamic society. And in the face of this dynamic society, they, they fear lest something old and precious be destroyed. And of course, at least on a preliminary level, the precious thing Grant thinks will be destroyed or has already been destroyed is Canada. <laughs> so, um, um, so, okay, but back to Dewey. So, um, it should be clear then that um, in our dynamic, or again, Dewey doesn't say dynamic, right? I, that's like our non-static society. In our society that's no longer static, um, well, first of all, loyalty, as Royce understands it, is not going to be appropriate. Um, loyalty means you take a cause and you stick with it <laughs> um, unless and until you find that it that it like conflicts with an overriding principle the principle of loyalty to loyalty um, according to Dewey that might seem like a good strategy in a static society like maybe the society that William Lentil was in but uh 
uh, it's not a good thing to do in a dynamic society because um, the conditions will change and uh, you won't change with them. Um, so you won't be confronting the actual problems that the society faces, but rather some other problem that seemed important to you at the time you gave your loyalty. Um, so, but it's not only, it not only conflicts with, with loyalty in Royce's sense, but it conflicts with the overriding principle of loyalty to loyalty. That's also a fixed idea. Um, and it conflicts with any fixed idea like this, like the categorical imperative. Um, I mean, that's, you know, so like I think I said a long time ago, what pragmatism, what does this mean? I, I mean, like I probably, probably, there probably could be, I mean, I know there could be a whole course on pragmatism and what the hell does this mean? But, and it, it definitely means different things to different pragmatists. But I think Dewey, like, remember I said, and so maybe it is what I was saying last time. I said I couldn't see the clear traces of his early encounter with Kant, but maybe you can see it there, right? But like one thing, pragmatism to a Kantian, a, like a pragmatic, um, the pragmatic rule is the rule that's imposed by a hypothetical imperative. Right, a pragmatic rule is a rule that says if you want X, then do Y. And right, according to Kant, the um, every pragmatic rule like that is like um, subservient to the pure practical rule, which is the categorical imperative, which says do this. <laughs> it doesn't ask what you want. So, like, so, so, um, one thing pragmatism can mean, and I think we can see from this that this is something Dewey thinks is that, um, that kind of overriding universal rule is a bad thing. Um, bad, and in some, in some sense, it's, in some sense, an impossible thing. Um, but although it's impossible, you can do a lot of damage in trying to make it possible. <laughs> but, you know, so of course, another example of an overriding universal rule like this would be the rule of universal benevolence to all beings. So, um, like, uh, clearly and not surprisingly, Dewey is, um, coming out against Jonathan Edwards also. Now, so, I mean, it's not exactly that Dewey thinks universal principles like that are wrong. I mean, like, if you want, like, he's even willing to agree that they're right. This is, you know, this. so this is near the beginning of chapter eight on page 71. As for ideals, all agree that we want the good life and that the good life involves freedom and a taste that is trained to appreciate the honorable, the true, and the beautiful. Usually we'd say the good, the true, and the beautiful. But I guess uh, he doesn't want to repeat good there because he just talked about the good life. Also, he may be deliberately using a, like Cicero's terminology here. But so in any case, as for ideals, all agree that we want the good life and that the good life involves freedom and a taste that is trained to appreciate the honorable, the true, and the beautiful, right? So there is, sure, there's a fixed ideal. We can all agree that that's a good ideal. But um, first of all, uh, you know, that kind of ideal is completely ineffective. So, like, you know, I may agree that's true, but it's irrelevant. It can't do anything. It co it's completely ineffective as far as reaching any desired goal, first of all. Um, so, um, right, 
after that, the top of page 72. Ideals express possibilities, but they are genuine ideals only insofar as they are possibilities of what is now moving. Save as they are related to actualities, they are pictures in a dream. So, I mean, um, Aristotle's definition of motion is um, at least one way to translate this. Actuality of the potential qua potential. That's Aristotle's definition of motion. And I think that Dewey is thinking of that when he talks about things that are now moving. Right? Like things that are moving are things that are whose potentiality is actual. Um uh, so like um a genuine ideal is a possibility that um as possibility already has some actuality um and uh in a like in a stat again in a static society that can make it seem like the ideal is fixed it's always the same possibility so what Kant would say you know the, the practical is the realm of things that are possible through freedom. We, you know, from the point of view of deciding what we have to do, we are forced to regard these things as possible. In a static society, it can seem like that is uh, like a uh, determination we make once and for all. What is going to be possible? What the, you know, uh, as Kant says, ought implies can, right? So, like, what what are we going to determine is is possible from a practical point of view? What what kind of thing is it? This possibility um, that is uh, um, is seen through freedom. It's going to be the possibility of what the categorical imperative always and everywhere remains. Um, and Dewey is said so, like the categorical imperative itself is, um, like when you when you look at it, it looks like a it looks like its derivation is logical, right? But it has no reference to real possibilities. It just goes by saying, like, well, anything else as a category, any other principle as categorically uh, commanded would involve a contradiction in the will. So this must be the right one, right? And so you, it, it can seem like um, the ideals are like logical possibilities that are floating off somewhere, and um, and you cannot notice how um, it's really some kind of real possibility, some kind of actuality that's moving already that makes them relevant at all. But once the society is no longer static, then the things that are moving, um, I mean, what could you say? That in this state, the motion is, is like, um, rotation around the center, basically, so to speak, right? And in this state, it, you know, so the motion is is like contained and never changes. Um, but in this state, uh, motion goes off in all directions, <laughs> and so um, and, and so these fixed ideals are like um, are seen to be completely impotent. As soon as the conditions change, um, you 
Right, so they're, they're like pictures in a dream, right? So you can say, um, yeah, the ideal is that everyone, there should be freedom and pursuit of happiness for everyone. And Dewey's not going to say, no, that's wrong because X, Y, Z. He's, but he, he's going to say, you know, like those are just nice words, but they don't mean anything. They don't mean anything as far as, as they, they don't signify any real possibilities for action. Action is always particular. And it's worse than this. I mean, worse that they're, they're worse than just impotence. I mean, I think I already implied this, but they're worse than just impotence because they're rigid and people believe that they're applicable. They interfere with what actually needs to be done to solve real problems, right? So like in this dynamic society, we have real problems. Um, what we need to overcome them is pragmatic principles that are based on the real possibilities of our situation. And instead, we're spending all our time, spending all our time thinking about these rigid, fixed, universal ideals. And so that's not only useless, but actually like makes us act the wrong way, or at least prevents us from doing anything useful. So, and you know, he has some pretty harsh things to say, like, here's on page 80, nothing would conduce more, for example, to the elimination of war than the substitution of specific analysis of its causes for the wholesale law of, quote, liberty, humanity, justice, and civilization. Right? So again, like, love of liberty, humanity, justice, and civilization might sound pretty good. <laughs> Like that's, you know, how our actions should be directed. But Dewey is saying, um, not only is that useless, but it allows war to continue because to actually eliminate war, we would have to look at it from a completely different point of view. We would have to look at the, the actual causes of actual wars and figure out what to do with the, about them on a case-by-case -case basis. Something like that. Um, and similarly, but this is even maybe a little stronger on page 79, the previous page, when he's talking about criminality. He says, with respect to it, and with respect to so many other evils, we persist in thinking and acting in pre-scientific, quote, moral terms. The pre-scientific conception of evil is probably the greatest barrier that exists to that real reform, which is identical with constructive remaking. Right? So the fact that when someone um, um, does a criminal act, we're inclined to focus on the immorality of what they did. Compare it with universal principles. Um, and um, um, and worry about how society can be reformed so that people won't be evil and is what prevents us from dealing with the real problem. Um, And, you know, I mean, but like someone carries out a mass shooting or like the executives of Enron steal all the pension funds or like, you know, um, whatever. And Dewey says, like, the problem is we start thinking, oh, that was evil, that was immoral. Um, and at that exact point, we're, we're failing to deal with whatever the real problem is. Um, and, okay, so, but moreover, it's again even worse than that, because not only does this interfere with progress for whatever goals we might have, and again, like the goals we have are going to be, you know, so like pragmatism seems impossible because, uh, or like to a Kantian, which 
I guess in this respect, I kind of am to some extent. Like to a Kantian, pragmatism seems impossible because th these pragmatic, these hypothetical imperatives only tell you what to do given that you want, something, right? Given that you have some goal, but is that goal any good? Right, so like, I mean, I think I quoted this in this class before, the thing where Socrates says, um, the sea captain knows how to get the passengers safely to land, but he doesn't know whether it's better for them to live or to die. <laughs> right, so like, um, it's, it seems like this is just, this just gives you rules for getting whatever goal you want, but, it, but that's not enough to determine your will, make, to allow you to decide how to act. Um, but I mean, so like what, what Dewey is thinking is the goals themselves are like, the goals themselves are not fixed. They somehow also emerge from the changing situation. I mean, so like, the goal we're being prevented from reaching also can't be specified in universal fixed terms, right? So like, or I mean, if you try to, it will again be something ineffective, right? So you may say like, we want to eliminate mass shootings because we have the goal of not having innocent people die, you know, whatever. Um, uh, Dewey is going to say, oh, well, it's very, very nice that we don't want innocent people to die, but that's like, that's meaningless. Let's, let's get to a specific goal. I'm not sure what an example is, but, you know, so, like, um, remember, I said this, and I think that continues to be true in this chapter, that, that Dewey, like, in some ways sounds very vague. <laughs> In, when, when he's in the process of saying that what we need is like specific thought and you know uh, not these vague abstractions, he says that in a very vague abstract way. Um, but in any case, right? So, uh, um, I mean, but like, is that an inconsistency? Well, so if you believe this, like, like maybe you don't want to give it an example. Right, because that example will stay fixed while the conditions change. Um, so uh, that would be the that would be a bad thing to do. It's it's, it's kind of hard to think this out completely. But anyway, I, I just I was that was the whole that whole thing was just a big interruption of my thought. Let me finish the sentence that I started. What I started saying was it's not just that having these fixed ideals interferes with achieving some goals we might have, but it also interferes with um, something that's crucial for the quote unquote integration of the individual. And like, remember, I, I at least suggested that I think this is right, that we can think of the integration of the individual as the kind of thing that, that Royce says that we need loyalty to achieve. Right, like the, the, the individual um, um, to become a self needs a way to unify their desires and beliefs and right, and the individuals by themselves can't do that. And so they, they need something from outside. Um, and um, um, Dewey says that what they need is, um, the kind of uh, interaction with actual problems of the society around them. Um, but that's, uh, well, I'll just read what he said. This is on page 72. The individual, uh, I don't want to read. Oh, here we yeah. go. Okay. Um, in this interaction, individuals attain an integrated view. The individual who intelligently and actively participates in a perception that is a first step in conscious choice is never so isolated as to be lost, nor so quiescent as to be suppressed. Right? So that, like, the, the 
I mean, again, up to a point, he's saying almost the same thing as Royce is saying, that the individual um, nerve to avoid being lost or suppressed, um, that is, in order to avoid being, like, um, I think lost here means that, you know, again, that, that you have no guiding principle. Uh, that in order to avoid being lost or suppressed, meaning, um, that you're not allowed to follow any guiding principle, I guess, right? In order to avoid those things, what you need is interaction. Um, the interaction with, I mean, what he's talking, the kind of interaction he's talking about, this is from farther up in the paragraph, many outcomes may be projected and the movement may di be directed by many forces to many chosen goals once conditions have been recognized for what they are, right? So like the interaction is that the individual like recognizes the actual problems that we all face and participates in making choices and um, to attain particular goals under those conditions. So um, that's like that's what's necessary for the individual to become um, integrated or united. And these fixed goals, because they prevent that process, um, actually prevent individuals from coming to be true selves. So they not only make it impossible to deal with problems like war and criminality and whatever, they also make us um, um, disintegrate <laughs> as individuals. Um, and again, I think the idea is that in a static society, you wouldn't notice that, right? Because in a static society, you wouldn't notice that because in a static society, you can have what appears to be a fixed ideal, which is really based on um, accepting conditions as they are and achieving specific goals, whatever, because conditions as they are don't change. <laughs> the goals don't have to change. And so you can think that you're following an eternal fixed principle and you can, and that can be sufficient to integrate you as an individual. But as soon as we get to this dynamic society and the conditions are constantly changing, it becomes evident that if you still stick with this fixed ideal, it becomes uh, evident that, uh, that your attempts to, to choose what to do or who to be or, you know, are not based on anything real in your conditions. And so they're ineffective. Um, Okay, so like at this point, um, I think you should be pretty surprised <laughs> in the sense of like when you get to this point in the book, because it's like you've gone through this kind of, yeah, what feels like kind of vague floating from one point to another and this kind of like jargony language and whatever. And, you know, um, all of a sudden, we're like plopped down, like somewhere near beyond good and evil, <laughs> right? I and mean, what he's saying here is a lot like Nietzsche. <laughs> um, he's saying that uh, morality as such, universal moral principles, um, the thou shalt, as Nietzsche puts it, right? That's the categorical imperative that like, they have to be rejected because they're they're life negated. They're um, they tend towards the destruction both of society and of what Emerson and following Emerson Nietzsche called the sovereign individual. Right? They tend to make both of those impossible. Um, so. Um, so what's called for is a revaluation of values where we object, where we reject. Um, of course, I mean, I think one thing, one reason you might not 
have that reaction. I'm like, whoa, wait, how did we end up here? Is that the tone continues to be completely different from Nietzsche or Emerson. Um, and um, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly how to account for that. I mean, either, but first of all, I don't know exactly how to account for that, even in terms of like what particular features of the style is. I mean, because as I pointed out before, like one thing he shares with Nietzsche and Emerson is this like lack of clear signposts to the structure, right? You know, so like one thing that, you know, one important piece of advice we give about writing philosophy papers, right? Like if I gave a handout, which I don't, hardly for this reason, but if I gave you a handout, how to write a philosophy paper, how to write a good philosophy paper, right? One thing it would say is that like every paragraph and every sentence within a paragraph should be where it is for some particular reason related to the overall flow of what you're saying. And you should make it clear to the reader what the reason is. <laughs> and the main way of making it clear to the reader what the reason is, is these little words like therefore, but, you know, and I remember this was a long time ago that a grad student was complaining to me saying that, because um, I was pointing out that, you know, what they had written, like, was deficient in this respect. I mean, I mean, like, first of all, obviously, it's easy advice to give, but, you like, you, first, first, you have to have somewhere particular that you're going, the flow of what you said, mm -hmm. which is especially hard to do when the reason you're saying anything at all is just because you got an assignment. <laughs> so there isn't really a point that you're trying to make, you're just trying to fulfill the assignment. But but in any case, so I was complaining that what they had written was, was deficient in this respect. And they said, you know, you're just trying to impose these, these analytic philosophy norms of writing on me. And I was like, okay. And I pulled down like Jerry Dodd and I looked it up. And like you could see every paragraph began, therefore, but whatever. <laughs> so, but if I had had, um, Emerson or Nietzsche or Wittgenstein or Dewey, <laughs> it wouldn't have been true. So in that way, he's he is like them. The style is like them, but it has a completely different effect. And uh, this is um, like I feel like like in Emerson and Nietzsche both, and of course Emerson and Nietzsche are not exactly the same, hurt <laughs> by any means, right? But in Emerson and Nietzsche both, the effect of this is like it keeps you constantly on your toes. Like you're like, wait, where did that come from? Wait, what's coming on now? <laughs> you know, it's like someone kind of like slapped you in the foot. And whereas in uh, Dewey, I find it kind of numbing. Like I just like that, 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 that. <laughs> and um, I mean, I don't know, like maybe that's just my reaction to it. Like, my house may vary for it. Um, but if that's true, it seems there must be a good reason for it, both in terms of it should be possible to say exactly what it is about the style that's different. I mean, I think the you know, the lack of images, right? I mean, that's something that uh, Emerson and Nietzsche both have lots of. Um, and Dewey does, it's mostly about stability and factors and society. And, you know, you know, when he wants to get really specific, he says, we shouldn't talk about society. We should talk about, and then, you know, like you might think you should, would say, we should talk about, uh, like, um, the poor starving beggar on the corner, who, you know, blah, blah, blah. But no, he says, we should talk about, uh, art and science and medicine and like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I mean, um, so that that has something to do with it, I guess. But the point, but also, I mean, the issue of basketball to account for this also in terms of like why, what's the difference between New Dewey's thesis, so to speak, or what he's trying to achieve, and what Nietzsche and Emerson respectively are trying to achieve, which of course. 
none of those three things is very easy to know. <laughs> uh, there must be some difference between that we could account for this difference in column and and I don't know what it is. But um but in any case, like um leaving aside that, right? And I think I feel it's like that, it's that kind of numbing thing that might I mean, I don't know how you reacted with so I don't know if you're reading keeping up with the reading or not. But <laughs> if you were, <laughs> imagine that you were, and like, I don't know if when you got to these sentences, you'd be like, wow, wait, wait, what are we talking about? Um, but I feel like you might not, because again, of this kind of nominee effect. Um, so, um, but in any case, be that as it may, you know, someone like Grant, who uh, would definitely know us <laughs> right away. <laughs> when something like this happens, you can see why he might feel that along with, and not just along with, like they're two different things, but somehow because of, like, because of, because the precious old thing that's going to be impossible to keep is Canada, it's also the possibility of the good life. <laughs> like, that's what's being thrown out here. Um, and um, and I think this will also account for. I don't know why I'm in a state. I haven't done this so much with other people. I'm giving so much of a preview of what's happening next, but like, but it, it feels important here. Um, that it's gonna. This this helps explain why Grant is so attracted to certain people who are responding to each other. Like um, the main ones being, on the one hand, Heidegger, and the other hand, Leo Strauss. If you don't know who that is, I'll say a little bit about it when we get the grant. But um, that, you know, he sees them as allies. They're, neither of them is a like, obvious icon of Canadian nationalism. <laughs> uh, but, but, but nevertheless, Grant sees like, their thought as, as possibly useful in this situation. Okay, but then now again, getting back to Dewey. So of course, Dewey knows he's going to get that kind of reaction from some readers, and he has an explanation for it. Um, and the explanation is not very flattering to intellectuals like Grant and perhaps like me. Okay, so the explanation basically he says that we. Like we intellectuals who are responding this way um, are like just like the people of the money culture who are defending their own private interests, and that they fear science and they 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 fear this dynamic situation because um, what they want to do is hold on to their own private property. Um, and so they do that, they defend their own private interests at the expense of what needs to be done for individuals, that is like people in general. <laughs> um, so, uh, right, so this is on page 77, where I developed this. Um, um, intellectual and literary folks, who conceive themselves devoted to pursuit of pure truth and uncontaminated beauty, too readily overlook the fact that a similar narrowing and hardening takes place in them. So the similar narrowing and hardening, in the beginning part of the paragraph, he's talking about how everyone recognizes that if you're engaged in the profession of a wage laborer or of like a capitalist, you know, that that's gonna have an like effect back on your personality or your your character or whatever, and the effect is going to be narrowing and hardening, right? And what he's saying, and what he's saying is that the intellectual and literary folks recognize that about the the business people and the wage laborers, but they don't notice the same thing is true of that. And then continuing the quote, their goods are more refined. But they are also engaged in acquisition. Unless they are concerned with use, with expansive interactions, they too become monopolists of capital. 
and the monopolization of spiritual capital may in the end be more harmful than that of material capital. Okay, so the idea is that, you know, what Grant is really going to miss in those old fixed ideals is that uh, those old fixed ideals were uh, suitable to be monopolized by the intellectual class. In what sense? Well, like, I guess you could say, like, it was plausible that someone often in power somewhere you know, looking down on life could be the like could be the expert, could be the person best qualified to to explore them. Um, right, and he says the same thing in the this is actually on the next page on page seventy eight. The continuation of that passage about. Um, the mind that is hampered by fear lest something old and precious be destroyed is the mind that experiences fear of science. The continuation is, he who has this fear, I'm skipping a little bit, does not walk the earth freely because he is obsessed by the need of protecting some private possession of belief and taste. For the love of private possession does not confine to material goods. <laughs> right? So, like, that's going to be his response to this reaction and again the reaction is the precious old thing that you're asking us to give up is morality <laughs> right? like that's the precious old thing that you're attached to um, shouldn't we like get a second opinion here <laughs> right so like um and his response is um you're attached to that because you think of it as your private intellectual possession. Um, and you you fear that like um, if it becomes recognized that ideals have to constantly change as conditions change, and they you know, and they have to be like, so to speak, in the minds of the people who are applying them at the time they're applying them. Um, because they can't be specified in advance and discussed in the abstract and whatever, that you're gonna uh, you're gonna hate that situation because it means someone like you is irrelevant. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know what so this has to do with details he doesn't fill in, right? Like, so remember, like he filled in how the industrial part of socialism was gonna work. And you know, it seems like the captains of industry were not going to be out of a job. Like they're still sitting in this council directing industrial relations. I mean, and it's not even clear that they're going to be paid less, right? Because he said socialism is not about evenly distributing wealth. So I mean, of course, in 19, well, actually, is that true? Probably not. In between it is true. Right, like at some point, the difference between the pay of the CEOs and the pay of the worker was much less than it is today. But that was probably between 1929 uh, experts. But in any case, so um, uh, so, so so like however much that is, the point is they're they're still going to get they're still going to have private possessions. <laughs> they're just not going to get to decide what to do with them. You know, like with the same freedom they. With the same apparent freedom they have before. It's apparent freedom, right? Because they too are not integrated individuals in the situation. So they too are not really choosing freely. So, anyway, so he has that, at least the suggestion for how that's going to work. How is intellectual life going to work? Is there going to be like a meeting of the captains of morality with the left representatives of? Something and public officials to. I, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I guess like one person on that council would be Dewey <laughs> if it were set up. Right? So, uh, um, and maybe Grant would be off that council. Um, which makes this this case not exactly parallel to the case with the captains of finance and the industry. 
But again, I'm filling in something that he doesn't really fill in himself. Um, so, but in any case, that's his answer to this reaction, I think. Um, is it? Is it true that that's where this reaction comes from, primarily? I mean, I think someone like Grant would, would, agree, would probably agree that that's one of the main places this reaction should come from or has to come from, from the intellectual roles. Um, uh, even though he doesn't place much confidence in the intellectual or contemporary. Um, they're too influenced by liberalism or whatever. But uh, um, but like, so where has the resistance, like take the case of, I mean, I think you could take the case of criminality, you could take the case of war, you could take the case that, again, Dewey doesn't mention like slavery and its aftermath. And you could ask, where in our society does there does uh, resistance to seeing that in non-moral terms come from? <laughs> and uh, it's not probably in the, in the same place in those three different cases. They, it's probably from three different places, but none of them are really like the literati. <laughs> I mean, uh, like, I mean, for sure, if you, if your platform is, we have to recognize that the problem with criminality is not that criminals are evil, but that they're relevant. And we just have to deal with the causes and whatever in each case, that that's going to be a very unpopular opinion. <laughs> um, um, and I mean, I think that's true in all those, those other cases too. Um, so, uh, um, so what, so, I mean, like, is that an objection to doing, or is that just a sign of how well the standardization works? I mean, then what do you have to say? The intellectuals are kind of like, not only similar to, but actually like in cooperation with the patterns of finance and industry and are making this happen. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what he would say about that, but it does seem like a worry. Um, okay, be that as it may, I, um, I think. So there haven't been any questions about this. <laughs> there haven't been questions about stuff for a long time, I guess. At one point there were a lot of questions and like back and forth. And then I guess that always happens as the quarter goes on. Maybe I shouldn't bring myself for it. I'm just tired. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, believe me, I feel like that too. But of course, I still I'm getting paid, so I still have to <laughs> Right. Oh, there you go. Um, but uh, um, but so I mean because I want to go on to it in the last um, few minutes to a somewhat different topic that but I think couldn't be addressed until I said all of this, which is okay. So um, what does do we think the new kind of individuality will be like? How will this work? How will this harmony be achieved? And you know, he says, this is a this is a good quote <laughs> if you wanted to answer one of the prompts I just put up. <laughs> Although it might not be the only answer to it. Um, like I think I said something like, what does Dewey think is the problem of the 20th century? <laughs> if it's not the color, right? So this is what he says on page 16. 
The problem of constructing a new individuality consonant with the objective conditions under which we live is the deepest problem of our times. Imagine Du Bois starting <laughs> his book that way. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of constructing a new individuality consonant with the objective conditions that are treated. <laughs> I mean, I, you, you can hear something about why I'm calling it numbing. <laughs> but in any case, um, so that's the problem. The, the, the problem is to construct, like, you might say, the new socialist man. Again, here I feel like, although I know almost nothing about this, so I'm probably been totally wrong. I feel like Dewey might have quote to Lenin somewhere there, right? Like the new Soviet man, right? But in any case, you had to make so, like, well, so how is this going to work? And Dewey says, well, I can't explain exactly what the new individuality, individuality is going to look like. This is in chapter five on page 49. I am not anxious to depict the form which this emergent individualism will assume. Indeed, I do not see how it can be described until more progress has been made in its production. Right, so like it's you know not clear what this new individuality is going to look like, and it can't be described until we've made more progress in its production. Um you know, like if if you think, well, wait, how can you work for its production then? I think part of the answer is it says this is page 35. And then, you know, this might be similar to an answer Nietzsche would give. Like if you ask him, so what is the philosopher of the future really going to be like? <laughs> and how can we work towards this goal if we don't know? So Dewey says that the task is mostly negative, actually. If we could inhibit the principles and standards that are merely traditional, if we could sloth off the opinions that have no living relationship to the situations in which we live, the unavowed forces that now work upon us unconsciously but unremittingly would have a chance to build minds after their own pattern, and individuals might, in consequence, find themselves in possession of objects to which imagination and emotion would stably attach themselves. Right? So, um, all we have to do is really just clear away this bad money culture and, you know, then the influences that are already acting on us will, will take care of the rest. He doesn't always say that, but that's what he says here, it sounds like it. So, okay, I mean, fair enough, but um, there seems to be an assumption here. I mean, the assumption is that there is some form of individualism, right? That that's, that this this reconciliation or harmony is possible. Um, and like, where do we? Why do we know? Right? Like, maybe this new phase of industrialization actually, like, there's no way to come into equilibrium, so to speak. And so we're just screwed, right? I mean, like, I don't know. So, like, what will happen? The Dewey doesn't. In fact, the way he talks about nature, I think you can see that he hasn't even conceived of this. But Dewey doesn't talk about the the possibility that this industrial civilization will destroy nature, right? I mean, he talks about like that that it has the potential to use nature. To be, make nature our ally, but he doesn't worry about its potential to to, to like destroy nature. <laughs> um, but you might imagine that's what would happen. This society will self-destruct because it will destroy its, the conditions for its own um, uh, living, right? Something like that. Well, so I mean, and so why not think something like that would happen? And I mean, is there some kind of dubious axiom here that Dewey is relying on? So like Grant is going to talk about the axiom, the supposed axiom that whatever is necessary is good. Um, is, is that what Dewey is assuming, right? Like that's the axiom of like progress, 
right? That, that the way the world necessarily changes is always for the better. So there must always be a way of making the best of whatever situation we find ourselves in. Um, that's exactly like Grant is going to say that that is um, blasphemous. <laughs> we'll see why she says that. But like, what does Dewey have to say in response? Oh, I only have one minute, so I won't say very much about this. But what he says is, well, we actually have in science not only the means by which we're going to achieve this, right? So like, once a uh, technique is freed from the money culture, it's going to like naturally adapt itself to achieving the individuality we need for our society or something like that. But science is not only that, but science as a community is actually like an embryonic example of what things are going to look like. Right? So he says the scientists are all working on these, this big communal project, and yet it's one that requires initiative and um, independence and inventiveness from each individual scientist. And so if we want to imagine, and he goes into detail about how the experimental method and various things are, are you know, are involved in this. And he says, we want to imagine what the, the new individualism is going to look like. Imagine that we're all going to be scientists. Um, so, I mean, this is a pretty rosy picture of what the scientific community is like. It's it's kind of Popper's picture against Kuhn's picture. I was going to teach 125 philosophy of science next year, but it turns out I'm not. I'm going to teach 100 me instead. But um, like, yeah, Popper's picture versus Kuhn saying that science involves like. Um, being presented with rules for solving puzzles and spending your whole life being addicted to solving puzzles. <laughs> um, so, like, Popper's response to that is, yeah, there is something like that in science now, but it's a bad effect of the military industrial complex. <laughs> like the, the, you know, the mass science that was required as part of World War II. Um, uh, so science isn't really like that. It's just and that is, you could say that according to Popper, the thing that Dewey was hoping for, the reverse happened, right? Like the money culture invaded science and made science itself. Um, uh, of course, Kuhn disagrees. So uh, when I, someday when I think one day five, then I can that. But um, for now, we'll see you next week.